Uh, thank you so much. It's an absolute thrill to be here in Sarasota. And uh, the truth is the invitation arrived uh, last winter when we got our eighth foot of snow in Boston. And uh, no, the real truth is that I, I enjoy coming to Sarasota. I have family here. And, uh, and I'm really honored uh, to be here and to share a stage with a remarkable group of people. Today, I'd like to tell you about my passion, about uh, my intellectual journey. The journey begins in Peru, in uh, the vertical landscape of the Andes Mountains. I grew up in a small town in West Virginia, and I love mountains. And, uh, but I also fundamentally believe that engineers and scientists have a great deal to learn from the humanities. And so in college, I studied structural engineering, but I also studied archaeology and anthropology. And that led me to Peru where the Inca Empire, about 600 years ago, built a highly complex civilization with a road system throughout the Andes Mountains. And any of you who have traveled in this area, you know that traveling by land is not easy. They invented something remarkable for their road system. Long span suspension bridges over the canyons of the Andean region. And many of these bridges survived until the late 19th century. So these are drawings from the 1870s by explorers. I sometimes think I was born a century too late because it would have been amazing to go and see and cross these bridges. When the Spanish arrived in 1532 and they saw these bridges, which were longer than any bridge in Spain, they were completely terrified. They crawled across them on their hands and knees. They called them the work of the devil. Almost miraculously, one of these bridges survives today in a remote region of Peru. And perhaps the most incredible thing about this bridge is that it's built entirely out of grass. So the grass that you see growing on either side of the canyon is used to build the bridge. So my definition of pink is, how about the person who had the idea to use the natural grass to go across this canyon? <laughs> That's creativity. How do you get a grass bridge to last for 600 years? Every single year, four villages come together and they have a three-day party. It begins with gathering the grass. Every household produces about 150 feet of cord, about the size of your index finger. You can see being created on the right. And then those cords are laid out in bundles, and those are braided to form a large cable, which becomes the structural element for the bridge. So the audacity to use these short strands of grass to go across a canyon is, is pretty incredible. And on the second day, the old bridge is cut down. The new cables are installed across the canyon. And <clears throat> this is what it looks like at the end of the second day with four cables for the floor of the bridge, two for the handrails. And on the third day, the work comes down to a single uh, family, Victoriano, who you see on the left, his family has been rebuilding the bridge for at least 300 years. And <clears throat> it's not easy. You're over a rushing river, and you're braiding together these cables. And uh, about 20 years ago, Nova did a television production documenting this process. And on the right, you see the producer who had the honor to be the first to cross that year. <clears throat> Like the Spanish, uh, 500 years earlier, he was absolutely terrified. And he asked one of the villagers, you know, if I lean out on a cable, maybe it'll just go out into space. And I grab the other cable, and maybe it'll go too, and it'll flip over and dump me into the canyon. And he said, does that ever happen? And the villagers said, oh, yeah, that happens all the time. <laughs> and He was obviously giving him a hard time, but uh, if you have a chance to go to Peru and cross this bridge, you'll see that it's a fairly lively structure. It's quite an experience. Um, <clears throat> I recommend not telling your mother that you're going to do that. And, uh, and for me, this amazing little work of technology is an example of infrastructure embedded within a community. It's also completely biodegradable and sustainable. You could do this for 10,000 years without endangering that amazing 11-city ice tour. <laughs> but perhaps as an engineer, the most extraordinary thing, I spent years studying the technology of it. I, I tested the cables and found out their strength. And that was a very strange moment in the lab at Cornell University. People were not used to engineers playing with primitive old bridges. And the attitude among engineering was often, what could we possibly learn from this? For me, one of the most important lessons is about 40 years earlier, 
a development agency built a steel truss bridge next door to the grass bridge. So it's completely obsolete. You didn't need it to get across the canyon. But what the communities needed every single year was the party. The bridge was a byproduct. So the infrastructure was so important to these communities that they kept having the party. Now, of course, 40 years later, the steel truss is corroding and is falling down and is no longer functioning, hasn't been maintained, it's been introduced from outside, and the grass bridge survives. 20 years later, this journey for me reached a really important point this summer when the Smithsonian Folklife Festival featured the bridge in Washington, D.C. and brought 12 of the master builders from Peru to Washington, D.C. Many of them had never been outside their little area and built the bridge on the mall in front of the Washington Monument. So this was an incredibly exciting moment. There's an exhibition now at the Museum of the American Indian which will be up for a few years on the Inca road system. So you can go and learn more about that. <clears throat> now, one of the amazing things about the technology of the bridge is the Spanish tried for several centuries to span the canyons with their system, which they had inherited from ancient Rome. But the problem with building a huge arch is you need to have the formwork, the wooden frames in place while you place the stones, and that's very hard over a rushing river in a deep canyon. So they basically failed. They, the technology didn't, uh, didn't work in the Andes. But I want to spend most of the rest of the talk talking about compression structures and going back to that Roman tradition. For me, the greatest building of all time is the Pantheon in Rome. If you ever have a chance to go there and see it on when there's a heavy rain falling through the oculus, or even better, when there's snow falling through the oculus, or even better, the one saint's day of the year when the firemen in Rome drop red rose petals through the oculus. These are poetic moments that you should see at some point in your life. But what's amazing about this building from an engineering standpoint is it was the longest span of an archer dome for 18 centuries. So all through the Renaissance, Brunelleschi's dome, St. Paul's in London, St. Peter's in Rome, none of them exceeded the span of the Pantheon. But what few people know is that the Pantheon dome, although it's been there for 2,000 years, is very badly cracked. It has cracks that are about a foot wide, and they're perfectly natural part of the structure. If the fact that it's been there for 2,000 years should tell us something, and, uh, but visitors today don't get to see those. So we've been studying the three-dimensional nature of the Pantheon, uh, working from laser scans and documenting the geometry of this remarkable building, and then 3D printing it in order to understand what would make it fall down. And we do this because we don't want it to fall down. And we also don't want unnecessary interventions. And so we have a common problem in engineering where not having studied very much history or history of stone structures, it's very easy to approach an old building and say, this building doesn't stand up, I just did a calculation and it doesn't work. And what I always tell my students is if the building's been standing for a thousand years and your calculation says the building does not stand, <laughs> it's not the building that's wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> So we're also doing this for large Gothic cathedrals, working from laser scans and 3D printing. And these laser scans help us capture the geometry, so we collaborate with art historians and computer scientists. And then working from those billions of data points, we're able to uh, create small-scale structural models, which we can use to study and test and, and do basically groundbreaking research by playing with children's building blocks. So this is the world's first 3D printed flying buttress, um, which is a completely obscure topic, almost ob as obscure as bouncing drops of water that you'll hear about this afternoon. But this allows us to understand what would make something fall down and what makes it stand up. And so we give PhDs to students at MIT for playing with children's building blocks. And then I go home at night and I play with blocks with my kids. And so this allows us to help save buildings, in particular in earthquakes, because these are the really crucial problems. So this is a recent PhD, uh, again, playing with building blocks, and it matters. It matters for cultural heritage. It matters for life safety. The Basilica of Assisi in Italy is one of the most glorious buildings of all time as well. Beautiful frescoes by Giotto. And uh, in the late 90s, there was an earthquake and a camera crew was inside and captured the moment of the earthquake striking. And tragically, four people lost their lives 
but in addition, the frescoes were lost, the basilica was closed for two years, and there was economic damage, of course, to the community. And in a recent study, <clears throat> we've determined that there were many earthquakes over the last six centuries that occurred closer to Assisi and were more powerful, but there was an intervention in the last few decades that removed a lighter traditional roof and put in a much heavier, stiffer roof and changed the behavior. So if we as engineers don't understand the implications when we enter into an old structure, we can actually do damage uh, rather than, than help the structure. Now, I am an MIT professor and I have to teach you one technical idea. Um, and here's the technical idea. If we take a set of weights and hang them on a string in tension, so in this case we have seven weights, which are the seven stones of this arch, if we could somehow freeze that string and turn it over, it would be the line of force and compression that stands within the arch. And we can use that simple idea to show how buildings like this stand up. This is Selby Abbey in England, where when a tower was added, it caused a differential settlement in this church of about three feet from one side to the other. It happened 800 years ago, so uh, the building's still standing, but we like to be able to prove that an arch over the centuries can dance and adapt and can, uh, and can still stand, and so we're developing computational techniques to try to show that cultural heritage like this does not need uh, uh, heavy interventions and that they're safe. And we're deeply inspired by projects like this. This is King's College Chapel at Cambridge University, which was built, it was finished in 1515. So it has its 500th birthday this year. And uh, I was very fortunate to study here for my PhD and I often gave tours on top of this vault. It's a 42 foot span, it's four inches thick. And when you're standing on top of the vault, it's doubly curved, it's about the thinness of an eggshell. And then, to make things interesting, near the walls, the walls have leaned away and there are four inch cracks that you can fit your hand through. And you can look down to the floor 84 feet below. And you're standing up there, and often I'm doing it with an audience like this, and I say to them, the nerve of these people <laughs> to build something like this without ever having taken a course in uh, nonlinear dynamics or applied mathematics at MIT. And, um, and so we like to try to prove that such things are stable and take inspiration from them. The best thing about this is no building code in the world would allow you to build this today. <laughs> it's been there for 500 years, you could not build this today. What can you build? You build projects like this, a single degree of curvature vault in a new airport. I visited this project five times, having studied Gothic vaults. I could not understand how this building stood up. I took pictures, I photographed it. And one morning I turned on the news and I learned the answer. It does not stand up. This is the Charles de Gaulle Airport. This is a $1 billion collapse and caused tremendous problems for anyone flying through Paris for, for years afterwards. And all because we've lost the connection between geometry and gravity and structure. And that's what Gothic builders and great builders of the past were so connected to because um, Stones are only work in compression, and if they're not held in place by compression, then, uh, then the structure falls down. So <clears throat> I wanna close the talk with showing you how we apply this to design. So uh, we take historical ideas. This is an example of vaulting, which was developed in North Africa, we believe in the 13th century or so, when it arrived in Spain and Europe in the 14th century, it was like a microchip. It was a, an incredible new technology. You could build a vault using thin bricks and fast setting mortar to cover space with no support from below. And so when this arrived in Europe, all over uh, Spain and Italy, it was seen as an incredible new uh, technology. This is about a six foot span. It's uh, less than half an inch thick. It has no steel and quite high load capacity. <laughs> if you get the geometry right, if you can find these hanging lines of force, these compressive lines of force that lie within it. And it was this same idea and this exact same technique that an immigrant family bought to the US from Spain, the Guastavino family, they built the ceiling of Ellis Island where my great grandparents arrived from Italy in 1922. And when this building was abandoned for 40 years to freeze, thaw cycles and all sorts of problems, they came back 
And when they renovated the building, out of 30,000 tiles, they found 11 that were slightly loose. So the building's in incredibly good shape and is a beautiful, beautiful monument to their work. Rafael Guastavino, father and, and son. They also built the Oyster Bar at Grand Central Station in New York. New York City's first underground subway station. You can say we don't build infrastructure like this anymore. What a cathedral this space is. And magnificent spiral staircases, very thin, with no computers, none of the benefits of what we have today, and truly remarkable structures. One of their largest projects was a major dome in New York where the masons were supported on the bricks that they'd laid the day before. And they built it in concentric rings, one of the biggest domes in the world. This is St. John the Divine. And so they also built the dome of the State Supreme Court building in Florida, about 1,000 buildings all over the country. So we took this company's technique, which was really from North Africa centuries earlier, and we've applied it to projects in England, uh, building shallow domes and tile with natural lighting, natural ventilation. This is a very low energy building. The walls are made of compressed earth. There's grass on the roof, which is kept trimmed by the neighbor's sheep, and it's operating as a zero energy building. We thought the structure was very daring. We made a very shallow dome, and then we found one by the Guastavinos that was twice as flat as ours, which we basically can't explain. And then that led to a project in South Africa where working with a local architect, an incredible architect, Peter Rich, and local communities, we developed bricks made of soil on site to build arches, vaults, and domes, training local workers to basically build a structure out of the earth from the site using these historical methods. That basically gave rise to a museum at a World Heritage Site in a remote area of South Africa in Mapungubwe. And to our tremendous surprise, a few years ago, out of 700 buildings from all over the world, this building was named the World Building of the Year at the World Architecture Festival. We thought it was kind of a crazy project out in the, out in the bush. And it ended up being an incredibly important project to show what's possible with limited resources, very low energy. And now Norman Foster in England is proposing, inspired by this project, to build vaults for medical supply centers throughout different regions in Africa, and we're working with him. But I close with a, an extraordinary project which we worked on over the last year to honor an MIT police officer, Sean Collier, who was tragically killed by the Boston Marathon bombers two years ago. And MIT set out to build a memorial to Officer Collier that would symbolize Collier Strong. And the architect, my colleague Mi Jin Yoon, proposed a star-shaped figure to be built in stone. And the question was, could we do it in stone, in, in granite? And so we worked with these simple ideas of arching action to support uh, this flat part of the geometry. We worked with the architectural team writing custom software that allowed them to change the geometry and to always keep it in equilibrium. And then we worked with 3D printed models to create, uh, to understand the construction process. It's not quite this easy in the real project because they weigh, it weighs about 400,000 pounds. And we use the uh, 3D printed models to understand the stability under earthquakes. We do have earthquakes in Boston. And so a lot of sophisticated engineering, but what we had learned from studying historic structures before that and uh, to prevent that from happening in an earthquake. So we go to a quarry in Virginia, quarry large blocks of granite. Those are selected mostly from blocks that have already been taken out of the ground. Those are milled by a five-axis milling machine in Wisconsin and by a robot with a big saw blade on the end of it, which is moving around in space. Talk about a horror film. <laughs> and is able to carve these stones to within an accuracy of one millimeter. And, um, and working together as a team with the contractors, bringing these stones all together on our campus to build this structure this winter, last winter, in order to open in the spring. And then we got nine feet of snow, the world record, or the, the record for Boston for snow. And, uh, but eventually, we were able to lower the scaffolding and prove that the structure would stand as an arch. We refined the geometry until it worked in compression. And uh, here's the, the installers, which included, the construction team included the brother of the police officer, Rob, who's second from the right. 
uh, was manager of the project on site every day. So you can imagine how emotional it was for all of us to contribute to this project, but we wanted it to endure for centuries. And so what we have is a complex structure which is milled to an accuracy of a few millimeters. And I'd like to think that if the Roman builders saw this, that they would say, yeah, that's a nice piece of masonry. <laughs> and finally, I would like to close by saying that our work is in a constant dialogue with the past. We think it's crucial that scientists and engineers reach across to the humanities and we learn from each other, and it's been a great joy to see that there are so many open questions from historical questions, and this project would not have been possible without 20 years of studying ancient technologies. And finally, I have to say the most extraordinary coincidence of all is that the guy who owns that robot who made these stones came from Wisconsin and signed up coincidentally to be at Pink today. Jim Durham is here as well. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> That's a great